Guys, Billy back here again with you. Uh, Fuel by Faith, power loss tonight. So good to have you guys online. Good to have you guys here in person. Um, and I know it's awkward when I'm talking to people out there and talking to you there. So one of you guys is just going to have to get over it. So <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> but it's good to be back. Sorry we've had a couple of weeks off. Uh, hope you guys got out and did something fun this weekend. Hopefully you did something inside since it's been a scorcher all weekend. Uh, but yeah, you know how that goes. So hopefully, I'm not as sunburnt this time as I was last time, so we should be all right. Uh, if you watched my invite video, uh, if you guys watched it or I don't know if you did or not, but Pastor is doing a call to prayer tonight, so that's what the rest of the church is doing from six to seven. They're having a prayer service, and uh, and I've been asked if I would uh, if I would take part in a little bit of that here in our class. So that's definitely what I want to do first. So if you, nobody has seen this yet, um, this is something that church has put out earlier today. And this is a call to prayer for, you know, everything going on in the country, in the world. You know, we got COVID, we got civil unrest, we got all kinds of other stuff going on. Murder hornets and flying snakes and, you know, jumping spiders and whatever else might be out there. Um, but we want to, we, you know, we want to we pray for everything that's going on. Um, you know, I personally want to want to commend any police, firefighters, EMS, uh, first responders, uh, veterans, you know, military, if you're current or if you are past served. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to all you guys because, you know, I have nothing but respect for you guys and, uh, and I say it all the time. That's a job that I'm glad somebody wants uh, because it's not for me. So I really appreciate you guys doing what you do. Um, and I think we got some vets in here. Cliff, you're a vet, right? Yeah. And David, EMS, vet, whatever. Yeah. Well, we'll pray for you anyway. I ain't nothing. <laughs> I'm a nobody. Um, yeah, we kind of jumped right into it, so we're going to just give it a few minutes here to get everybody logged on. I see we got a couple people logging on, and you guys know how this works. Go ahead and sh uh, drop a comment, uh, you know, shoot a like, do something to let me know that you can hear me, you can see me, and everything's going well. Uh, Zach will probably be on the uh, message board in just a little bit. But I wanted to go over these uh, these points of prayer here that, uh, that the pastor had put out, and so I, you know, I wanted to agree to do this for him. So an urgent call to prayer. So we're going to pray for the isolated, you know, people that are in hospitals, people that are, you know, nursing homes, places where, you know, maybe they don't even have uh, COVID, but they can't, you know, they can't see anybody. They might be having surgery or a heart attack or whatever, and they're in there all by themselves. Uh, so we want to pray for those guys. And uh, those asking God, are you there? I'm sure there's a lot of us asking that right now. <clears throat> I know, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of human nature right there, especially when you see everything that's going on and you you think, are you there? Do you see this? Do you see what's going on? Um, for those infected, for those that actually do have it, we know that it is a real thing. People do have it. And uh, my sister and her husband, uh, they, in fact, got it up in Virginia. And, you know, they recovered. Everything's going fine with them right now. But I do know somebody personally that has been, been uh, affected by, by this disease. Uh, for the frustrated, I think that's pretty much everybody, right? Frustrated. Uh, you know, yeah, I can't, you know, I got uh, two big races that I like to go to every year, uh, the, the MIDI at Road Atlanta in the springtime and Hyperfest at BIR, uh, which was supposed to be at the end of this month. Uh, both of those were canceled, and so I missed out on both of those. We were missing out on, you know, if you're into sports, if you're ball games or whatever the case, uh, that could be a bit frustrating even if you don't have, you know, have anything going on with you. For those who live in fear, uh, hopefully that's none of us, you know, hopefully that's none of you out there. There's no reason to live in fear, you know, don't, don't let what you hear and what you read, you know, get you all, get you all amped up and, uh, and whacked out. So we're going to pray for those that, that are living in fear. Pray for parents. Uh, I'm a parent myself, got three kids, two of them are school age and, uh, stay at the house with the wife and yeah, she could use some prayers. I'm sure, I'm sure there's quite a few of you out there that could. So, uh, I can, I can feel that one. Uh, we're going to pray for the newly unemployed. Um, I don't think anybody here has lost their job to this. I haven't, thank God. Uh, but my mom did. Uh, so, again, that's another case where, you know, it has touched somebody I know personally. Uh, she has been out of work for months now because of this, and I know that there's a lot of folks out there where that is the case. Um, in fact, she, she's she been out since March and supposed to go back on the 31st of this month, and I don't know if that's going to happen or not. So, yeah, she's been in a tight spot. Uh, for business owners, um, shout out to, you know, uh, Aaron and Sam. If you guys are watching, it's my bosses. Good job, guys. I appreciate you. 
uh, anybody else's bosses or business owners out there uh, you know it's kind of a little sketchy right now you don't know what business is going to be like you don't know if you should hire employees fire employees what you should do so pray for you guys uh, healthcare workers and first responders I mentioned those earlier um, you guys are heroes we appreciate everything you do you're on the front lines and for our church leaders um, that is a spot I would not want to be in right now you know um, everybody's got an opinion on the way things should go and the way things should open the way things should be run and so on and so forth and I'm not a uh, pastor and never have been but I imagine a lot of that probably goes on anyway even when all this is not going on uh, which is probably only you know exacerbated by all of this everybody's got an opinion on the way he should do things and so you know he's got to deal with uh, 1100 or 1200 people or whatever it is and he's got to think about each and every one of them and all different age groups and everything else and so uh, all of the leaders here at the church I wouldn't want to be in your shoes and uh, so you guys are doing the best you can and we appreciate that so you know we'll pray for you guys as well but if you uh but if you guys don't mind online and you guys here um, I'd like to join in you know I'd like to have a prayer and uh, and just take part in this in this special time that he has put aside for this um, so yeah let's pray while we uh, open up today <clears throat> let's pray father we uh we come to you today humble and thankful Father, we had a lot of things on this list, Father, and you know there there are many, many more, many more that uh, that I could never know, and that uh, maybe everybody in this room, even put together, couldn't could know, Father. There are things going on that that only you see, and you see the benefit, and you see the reasoning, Father. And we just pray that you would uh you would just uh, not allow us understanding, Father, because it's not our place to understand everything that you're up to, Father. We just pray that you would give us the peace. And the, and the knowledge and the wisdom to just, just go throughout our lives praising you and not living in fear, Father. We pray for, uh, for the leaders of this church and for all churches, Father, that uh, they're able to make the right decisions and that they're making decisions in the best interest of their congregations, Father. And, um, and we pray that those congregations would also have understanding, Father, that, uh, that these, these shoes are, are, are hard to fill and that, uh, that these people are doing the best that they can. And, and hopefully you would give them guidance in everything that they do. Uh, Father, we pray for the, the leaders of our country. Um, you know, Pastor said it perfectly this morning. Uh, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, Father. We just want that person to be a godly person and to, uh, and to do what you would have done and, uh, and seek you for leadership and wisdom in, uh, in any decisions that they make that would affect us. And, Father, we just pray for, uh, you know, for those that are isolated right now. Um, you know, if, they're, if they can hear me or if, or if somebody can pass this message along to them, uh, Father, I would just, I would just, you know, let them know that we are with them, that we do think about them, Father. That, uh, that they have people here that, you know, on the outside that that are are praying for them and uh, praying for the doctors and praying for the first responders and and, and nurses and and uh, everyone that may be involved in their treatment. So they are not alone, and uh, we would just pray that you would give them comfort through all of that. Uh, Father, we pray for teachers, for parents, for uh, for all these kids that. Uh, whose school year is up in the air still. Uh, Father, we just, uh, we just pray that these things will be done in your time. And, uh, and we, we don't need to know what's going to happen. We just need to know that you are with us. So just uh, give us that comfort. Give us that, that healing hand that only you can do. And Father, we just pray all of this over, over our community. We pray it over everyone in this class here, over everyone that can hear my voice. And Father, we pray it over everyone that, uh, that Pastor may be, uh, may be touching as we speak right now uh, in his prayer service. Father, we do all of this through the power of Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. 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 All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, yeah, I hope you guys uh, got, a chance to, got a chance to take part of that. And, again, if you, uh, if you know somebody that's isolated, if you know somebody that's in quarantine or whatever the case, uh, you know, pass this video along to them. You know, I'd love for them to know that they're not alone, that we are thinking about them. So, cool. Appreciate you. So, We'll get into tonight's lesson. So I titled this lesson, Power Loss. And you heard since you were a kid that knowledge is power, right? I mean, that's you know, something you heard from you know, Sesame Street, probably. Um, <clears throat> so our biblical tie-in tonight is going to be on, on how knowledge is power and why it's power. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk into some uh, automotive segment about what things can cause power loss. Now, we've talked a lot about power gains, you know, turbocharging and supercharging and making more compression and headers and intake porting and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, but what we're going to talk about tonight is why they would lose power based on maintenance or based on failures that would cause a car to lose power. Um, and obviously, because knowledge is power, we don't want to lose knowledge, right? So hopefully you guys out there on the internet can see this. But Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom 
from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So that right there is saying pretty much in black and white, the Lord gives wisdom, right? So keep that in mind. So over here we got Proverbs 2, 12 and 15, or 12 to 15. Wisdom will save you from the ways of the wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing what is wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Now, given what we just said about everything that's going on in the world and everything that's going on out there with protests and and stuff getting destroyed and cops and, and all the whole nine yards. I think this says a lot. I think that uh, we just said that the Lord gives wisdom, right? And we said that wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men. And we listed a whole bunch of ways in which men can be wicked. A lot of this is going on. And so this is why I decided to do this class. I actually had this one written uh, quite a few weeks ago. And something else came to my mind, so we ended up doing a different one. But I thought today was a really good day, especially with Pastor uh, with his thing about, you know, uh, powerless, being powerless. You know, he, he mentioned that today, um, and we are powerless. We're powerless to change it. So we just need to call on the one that can change it. So I thought that was a really good fit, so we decided to use that today. <clears throat> I'm turn the rotation off of my phone because it's bugging me out. <laughs> so Proverbs 16:16. 16, 16. Again, this is another one of those verses kind of like straight to the point. How much better to get wisdom than gold to get insight rather than silver? So, who here would trade money for wisdom? Right? I would. Like, you know, if you could be dumb as a bag of hammers and be rich or not be rich and be really, really smart, you know, which one would you take? <laughs> Had to think about it. Eh. Good choice, sir. Yeah, it's a good choice. <laughs> uh, sadly, some people are dumb as a bag of hammers and not rich, so I guess that would be really tough. But, <laughs> yeah, exhibit A. Uh, <laughs> but Colossians 3.16, uh, this is another one that goes along with what we're talking about here. So this is, uh, this is Colossians 3.16. I'm sorry, I said that. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So again, this is Paul talking here, and he is uh, he's basically saying the same thing we've been hearing you know, throughout this message is that Wisdom comes from above. Wisdom comes from God, and you need to ask for it. And uh, in everything you do, make sure you uh, give thanks to God through Jesus. So I think that's a pretty good advice. I don't care who you are. And uh, I've got two more, and this one I like a lot, and the next one is, is kind of a downer. But you'll see why I put it in there in just a second. So the next one kind of hit pretty hard. I almost didn't include it, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, Philippians 4, 8 through 9. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I think that that right there, I think that would save a lot of us a lot of headache. Agreed? I mean... If it's pure, lovely, admirable, right, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. I mean, you know, it's no secret that I spend wrenches for a living. I think a lot of us in here do. Uh, it's really hard to kind of put that into practice on the day-to-day. -day. <laughs> uh, at least it is for me uh, because, you know, you're not always thinking about things that are lovely or praiseworthy uh, when you're stuck up under a, a car, you know, that's, that's fighting you. So, you know, I think that's probably really, really good advice. Um, and, but this one, is, this is the one that I wasn't going to include, but I thought it really fit uh, with what we're talking about. And it's kind of a hard hit. But again, you keep with our theme about what's going on in the world, what's going on in the country, what's going on everywhere right now. We got people acting all kinds of ways. Uh, Hosea 4 6 my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge I also reject you as my priests because you have ignored the law of your God I also will ignore your children 
That's hard hit. Uh, that <laughs> when I read this today, um, you know, I had had the automotive side of this lesson put together for some time, but when I read this to kind of uh, add to the tie-in, I wasn't going to include it. But then I started thinking, I'm like, well, I mean, that pretty well sums it up, right? You're destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So I, I entitled this uh, lesson Power Loss. So, you know, we don't want to lose power. We don't want to lose knowledge. But the really strong words is because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you. And then it says, I also ignore your children. So I think there could be a lot said right there. I think uh, maybe maybe a, a lot of folks, including myself, could probably get put back on the right track if you take this verse right here to heart. So that's a tough one. It's kind of a dark verse, but uh, but again, you know, it's in the Bible, so you can look it up. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't write it. <laughs> so, yeah, if you don't like it, you know, take it up with the one that wrote it. Uh, <laughs> so does that make sense to you guys, those verses? That all that all makes sense? Uh, makes sense to you guys out there in Facebook land? I hope so. Uh, I see Charlene's watching. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I have an aunt watching from West Virginia. That's cool. Uh, so cool. So we'll get on to our automotive side of it. So we're talking about power loss. And if we're talking about power loss, we need to know what makes power. And when we talk about power, it's, you know, horsepower. It's the energy that we use to drive these things forward. Uh, and there's really three keys to making, making power. Of course, there's more to it than that. But to simplify it, you got airflow, which, you know, everybody's heard the old adage, the engine is just an air pump, right? Well, airflow includes intake and exhaust because we got to get air in it and we got to get air out of it. We got to do that as efficiently as possible under a wide range of of conditions you know high load low rpm low R or high rpm low load we got to do everything from in between climbing mountains to you know taking off down the drag strip so it needs to be able to to move airflow efficiently through the intake and the exhaust side we also need fuel not only anything without fuel you can suck all the air you want no fuel nothing's going to happen so we need fuel but we also we need pressure and volume uh, those two words are not the same you can have a very very high volume and low pressure and you can have very very high pressure and low volume but we need both in order to make to make power and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, toward the end and we need timing not only do we need ignition timing but we need to take valve timing into account so what you know that's a uh, time of chain or time of belt you know it's where the cam is in relation to the crank uh, that can affect power of course uh, but ignition timing as well is a huge factor on on uh, on power loss or power gain and that is when the spark plug is actually ignited in relation to the crankshaft degrees. So, you know, the optimum peak pressure is somewhere around 15 degrees after top dead center. So we want to ignite that fuel sometime before that so that its peak pressure is about 15 degrees past top, top dead. And that changes from car to car, from fuel to fuel, you know, whether it's turbocharged or supercharged or naturally aspirated and changes with RPM. So where you need to ignite that fuel to maintain that peak pressure uh, at 15 degrees past top dead center it changes all the time so that's where you know in the old days they used recurve distributors or vacuum advances but now we just do it all with a computer so uh, but those are the three things that are really really important to making power and of course compression you can't have you can have all the air you want all the fuel you want and everything happening at the right time uh, but with no compression there's no power uh, so that's why I put that one in the center because you, you could have all of that and no compression you're not making any power and you can have all the compression in the world and one of these things be totally out of whack and you're still not paying it, making any power. So that's kind of why I made this graphic the way I did. Uh, kind of reminds me of the old fire triangle, you know, the fuel. and the <laughs> but, uh, but tonight we're going to talk about two of these. Um, I was going to do all three, but the timing one actually, it deserves a class all itself. And timing, you know, kind of writes itself for a biblical tie-in. So <laughs> I figure I'll hold on to that one. But we're, uh, we're going to talk about these two tonight. So... Bear with me. So intake airflow. So we got this sweet ITB set up here on this BMW engine. Uh, not my engine, but I thought it was awesome, so I used that picture. If that is your engine somewhere out there on internet land, good job. The thing's sweet. <laughs> but this is a really good example of taking intake airflow seriously. Uh, it's got six individual throttle bodies. It's got you know machined air horns that are probably tuned length, I would imagine. Uh, looks like they got it perfectly bell mouth, no filters, no restrictions at all. So uh, that that thing is taking intake airflow very seriously. Um, but that's what we need, you know. Obviously, we're not going to have that on all of our cars, but that would be kind of the ultimate goal, wouldn't it? 
So in order to talk about uh, airflow, we're going to talk about VE. And I know that you guys that are sitting in here right now uh, have heard me talk about VE probably three or four times. Um, in fact, you might have even seen this, uh, this slide before. I don't remember if I used this one or not in the engines class. But it is extremely important. It's probably the most important factor uh, when it comes to making power. This can apply to lawnmower engines. It can apply to turbocharged engines, boat engines. It doesn't matter what it is. Volumetric efficiency is, is universal in the way that it applies to the internal combustion engine or gasoline ones anyway. <clears throat> Which I guess it probably would apply to diesels too, but not a diesel guy. You have to start another class for diesels. <laughs> uh, but VE is defined as the actual amount of air flowing through an engine compared to its theoretical maximum expressed as a percentage in which 100% VE means we have captured 100% of the maximum amount of air in the cylinders by mass. And keep that in mind, that's why I made that all capital by mass, because of the air's mass can change. The engine's displacement remains the same, however the density of the air in the cylinders can vary widely, and that's a very, very important thing to remember. Um, so there's a formula for this, and I'm not a mathematician, but if you want to work out that formula, you can. You can kind of get a, uh, get a good idea. Keep just, just the rule of thumb here is that most modern OE uh, naturally aspirated engines operate around 80%. 80-85% is considered pretty average for, uh, for, a, for a modern car. Now you get into turbocharged stuff and high performance engines, they can get to 100% and they can even go over 100% in a lot of cases, in which case that means they're bringing in more air than the engine actually is size, displacement-wise. When we say about displacement, we mean, let's say you got a three liter engine. That's, that engine can theoretically displace three liters of air for every cycle. You know, every, you know two, two crankshaft revolutions would be three liters of air. Uh, so in a perfect world, every time that thing spun twice, it would suck in three liters of air. Now, we all know that that doesn't happen. Now, you know, that's mathematically perfect. Now, like I said, you can build engines that, that can do that at certain RPM points, and they get real peaky, you know, and, they, and everywhere else they're, they're not very good. But if you want an engine that does everything kind of okay, 80 85% is usually where you're at. When you're turbocharging, obviously you're cramming more air into the engine, and the VE can go well over 100%. That's why you can make a 2-liter 4-cylinder have as much power as, you know, a 5-liter V8 because you can cram enough air into it that it's, it's basically taking in five liters worth of air uh, for two liters of displacement because you're cramming it in there so tightly. <clears throat> so that's why it's very, very important, and that's why it applies to every engine. Any increase in VE will be an increase in power, so keep that in mind. Calculating airflow needs, we're not going to go through this whole thing. Uh, you know, in fact, I included this in your handout materials, so if you want to download those or if you guys you know, do, do get those, um, you can calculate the airflow needs. But basically, this formula is used to calculate the engine air requirement at both peak torque and peak power. Why? Because we want to know the minimum requirement at peak torque or the highest point of efficiency, so that's when the engine is, is being its most efficient, and we want to establish the maximum requirement at peak power so we can determine the effective airflow range of the engine under wide open throttle conditions. So that's kind of a really wordy way to say that what we want to know is how much air is this thing capable of taking in? How much is it possible uh, at a certain RPM? So calculate the airflow for a 350 cubic inch engine with a torque peak of 5300 and a maximum engine speed of 65. So we do the torque peak, we work out the formula, and that comes out to 536 CFM at the torque peak. And the power peak, 350 times 6,500 divided by 3,456 is 658 CFM at the power peak. So that's cubic feet per minute. So that engine can pull 658 cubic feet per minute of air through it under ideal conditions at 6,500 RPM. So how many people here have heard CFM in like carburetor speak, right? Yeah. You know, the old Holly 750 or, you know, 650, 550, whatever the case is. Um, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the maximum, the maximum amount of flow that that carburetor, you know, can flow. 650, 750, 850, 1050, whatever it is. Um, normally, we talk about throttle bodies now with fuel injection. You know, it's usually 900 to 1,000 CFM or 700 CFM, whatever the case is. Uh, but when we're talking about CFM, that's what we're talking about. It's cubic feet per minute. So we're talking about how much airflow it can pull in. Using this calculation, you can actually see. 658 CFM at 6,500 RPM for 350. So a Holley 650 carb would be down, 
be right on the money. Um, this is why you know you don't want to over carb one either. Uh, that that opens up a whole other can of worms. We'll have to have another class on that. But <laughs> basically, the smaller the carb, the more responsive it's going to be. Uh, you can see that under peak torque, it only uses 536. So when it's making its most, uh, I guess, power per RPM, if you want to put it that way, uh, when it's making its most torque, uh, it's only using 536 CFM. So a very small carburetor would be very very responsive. And then you know you would need a little bit bigger for a higher RPM engine, but. No need to overcarb it, and especially with fuel injected cars, no need to over throttle body yet either. So that's really wordy. That's in your handout materials too, so hopefully you guys can go back and check that out. So changing the VE. So we, we talked a lot about VE. In fact, you guys are probably gonna be hearing VE in your sleep. But if you're gonna play with cars, and this goes out to you guys on Facebook land also, then uh, the VE is very, very important, and I would suggest that you do anything you can to research. Uh, the VE of your particular engine or your particular combination that you're building. So the optimizing intake runner length and volume to match flow of the cylinder head, optimizing throttle device size, whether it's a butterfly, multiple throttle plates, carburetor, whatever it is, to take advantage of intake runner flow. Optimizing cam profile to take advantage of cylinder flow characteristics as well as scavenging effects uh, due to valve overlap. So that kind of gets into a whole other science uh, about user resonance tuning and that sort of thing. Supercharging or compressing the incoming air above atmospheric and or decreasing the air temperature to increase its density. Both of those are very important. So we talked a minute ago about why they make huge power with turbo cars. That's what they're doing. They're actually cramming way more air into the engine than it could consume on its own and they're cooling it, usually cooling it below atmospheric, but cooling it to at least atmospheric um, temperature or ambient temperature. Uh, and because the cool air is more dense than hot air, you can use there's more air molecules to bind with the fuel and you can burn more fuel and make more power so you want it to be as cool as possible you know all you guys running around there with your uh, cold air intakes uh, that's what you're trying to do <laughs> uh, let's just, just make sure they're not hot air intakes you know that's that's the important part <laughs> so we talked about intake manifold design being a big part of this and again we, we're going to talk a lot about intake and exhaust because we're talking about things that kill power uh, and we'll, we, you know, we'll get into that in just a second. But this is very important as well. The intake system, including all piping, the throttle device, the plenum, the runners, is designed to control and direct airflow to the intake ports of the cylinder head. So all of this fancy stuff here, which I know it's an LS motor, and anybody who knows me knows that you know how I feel about that. But that is an awesome intake. <laughs> that is killer. That'd be worth having an LS for, absolutely. Uh, but intake manifolds come in a wide variety of shapes, sizes, and materials, which leads to extremely wide range of performance. And intake manifolds are usually designed as wet, meaning they, they flow air and fuel, or dry, meaning they flow air only. So this, is, this would be an EFI intake, this would be fuel injected. It would be a dry intake. There would be no fuel anywhere before the fuel injector, which is down here by the, by the intake valve. But a carbureted intake, you know, a big tunnel ram, or even just a regular old dual plane, it has to flow fuel and air, and that's a lot different story than just flowing air. They have to keep that fuel suspended. They have to keep it from falling out of suspension. They got to keep velocity up. Uh, they got to make sure that the turns and bends and such are, uh, you know, a certain way to keep the fuel distribution right. Whereas with EFI intakes, they can basically shape them any way they want, and uh, they just inject the fuel right at the intake valve. Now that setup right there, you can run twin turbos on it. Yep, sure could. The one on each side. In fact, they run them like this. I haven't seen this particular intake, but I've seen a different uh, twin throttle body intake for an LS motor that they use twin turbos on. Uh, or you, they use the big single throttle body and just use a Y, you know. Uh, the most common thing I've seen, <clears throat> for street cars anyway, is to run an intercooler with an inlet for each turbo and then a single outlet, you know, into this big center throttle body. So they usually do it right at the intercooler instead of doing it up here at the throttle body. Uh, because that way they can just run one giant intercooler, you know, it makes it packaging it a little bit easier. On a drag car or something uh, that you could run like ice boxes, you know, water to air intercoolers and you can have two separate ones, that, that would be ideal. That would be really cool for that. This thing looks like a, I don't know, it looks like an IndyCar engine or something. It's, it's pretty wild looking. I'm not even sure what, what, uh, what that came from or who built it, but I just thought it looked really cool. So, <laughs> all right, you cold air intake guys, this is all you right here. So, <laughs> can they make a difference? Absolutely. Are they always making a difference? No, definitely not. So when we're talking about that, our, again, we're talking about power loss tonight. So 
some things you want to do to make sure you're not losing power. And that's that's the big thing. You don't you know you don't want to take a step backwards. So the uh, piping can be defined as anything the air must travel through before getting to the throttle device, including air filters, mass airflow sensors, pipes, couplers, and boots. All of those things need to have flow in mind. You do you no good at all to have this nice, pretty three-inch stainless steel uh, air, in, you know, air intake, and then drop it down to an inch and a half little mass air meter, or have some sort of you know coupling, you know, from Lowe's, you know, with all the convoluted stuff in there, <laughs> some dryer piping or whatever, you know. Uh, so do you know good to have one element of it be really, really good if you're going to just, you know, make it go through uh, another element that is really, really poor? Because obviously we're talking about flow here, so the, the one restriction is what we're worried about. Uh, you know, if everything flows good up to a certain point, well, everything in front of that doesn't really matter. Uh, so that's what we want to do. We want to keep that in mind when we talk about, you know, the, the mass air sensors, the pipes, the couplers, make sure everything's smooth, make sure the bins are smooth, make sure all the transitions are smooth. Uh, ideally designed to provide the coldest air possible while providing the least amount of restriction. That's the hard part. You know, these OEs, they put a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money into making these intake air boxes on modern cars. And most of the time, it comes down to cost. You know, they're made out of plastic, they're routed in such a way that it doesn't look like it makes any sense at all. But they're trying to engineer it to make, make it quiet, for one thing. Uh, they're trying to make it cheap, trying to use the least amount of materials, uh, but they are usually trying to pick up the coldest air that they can. So if you are changing your uh, your air box or something like that on your car, you know if you've got a box that's sealed and the the inlet for the box you know goes out in the fender well or somewhere and picks up air outside the engine bay, and then you stick one of these on it, you know, and it's sitting right beside the header or right behind the radiator, uh, that is doing you no good at all because even though it flows a lot more or it may not even flow a lot more, but let's say that it does, it's picking up hotter air, and that hotter air is much less dense, and so you've actually effectively lost power by putting a higher flow intake on it. Um, so if you're going to do this, you know, you want to try and route it outside the engine bay. Uh, you want to have some sort of box or something that would seal it from the engine bay heat, uh, you know, route it into a fender well right up to the front of the bumper or somewhere. Uh, that it's not picking up hot air because it's more important that we pick up cold air than it is that we have high flow. And the reason for that is that most of the time that engine is not at peak VE. You're you're not running around on the street at you know 6,500 RPM at redline all the time. Or at least I hope you're not. I don't know. My son's in here. Maybe he is. I don't. <laughs> but I hope, usually you're not flowing 100% of what the engine is capable of all the time. But you are trying to make that thing as efficient as possible and in order to do that you need the coldest air possible so even at half throttle even at part throttle you know even at idle um the the, the car is going to run much more efficiently and much better using the coldest air you can possibly get to it so that's why it's very much more important to put it in the place you can get cold air to it rather than a lot of air you know what i'm saying um so piping should be sized large enough to meet the engine's breathing needs at max rpm under max load so we just kind of talked about that. You want to make sure that the pipe is not, you know, like trying to breathe through a straw. Uh, and even though it's good at, you know, everywhere from 2,500 to 4,500, if it falls on its face at 5,300 and the car redlines at seven, well, that's not doing any good at all. So you need to make sure that it is, in fact, sized. And I've got a chart that I'm going to include. An air filter should be free flowing, and any openings should be radius or bell mouth to smooth airflow into the pipe with no abrupt bends or sharp edges. That's something I see that drives me nuts. So a lot of times they'll put these big high flow filters on them and these, these real fancy pipes and then it'll just be dead cut on the inside. And usually it'll be stuffed inside the filter so that the pipe is actually somewhere about right here. And it's just a hard edge. And air does not like to turn corners. So you got that hard edge of that pipe there and that can actually be a flow restriction. Uh, so you wanna make sure that whatever system you're using has a bell mouth, has kind of a funnel shape on the inside uh, you know, with radius, if nothing else, at least radius the pipe um, and try not to make it stick out in the airstream, try to make it pull it back into the boot a little bit so it does create a little bit of a radius because that can make a huge difference in the airflow potential. So, yeah, just try to buy quality parts, I guess, is the moral of that story. <laughs> this is the chart. I included this in the handout materials, too. Um, I'll send you guys a link if you didn't get it. I think I sent you one already. Uh, but this is a really cool uh, chart that I found that I thought, you know, could be helpful. And it basically shows the pipe diameter in inches, 
So that's inch and three quarter, two inches, two and a quarter, two and a half, you know, all the way up to five inches. And then the maximum horsepower that that can support and the maximum airflow in CFM that it can support. So you can see here, you know, if you've got a car that makes 400 horsepower, you got two and a quarter pipe, you know, you're doing just fine. But if that thing makes 700 horsepower, and yeah, now your two and a quarter pipe's not doing so, doing so hot. You know, 285, you're looking at inch and a half, inch and three quarter, which I think is kind of small, but two inch is about about right. So you can see where that kind of goes all the way up to 2100 horsepower, which. I think only three people in this classroom are making 2100 horsepower, so that's not a big deal. But, <laughs> but yeah, I've included this in the handout material, so if you can't read that online, I'm sorry. Uh, the description of this video, it actually has a link where you can download them and check them out. But hopefully that makes sense to all you guys. So this is a big power killer right here. Who's wow. changed the air filter in their car in the last year? All right. All right, y'all are doing better than I thought. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just put one in my wife's car, and I don't know when the last time it was done. You know, I've only had the car a year. had 48,000 miles on it when I bought it, and I swear it went factory when I pulled it out. So, man, man, that ain't too good. You didn't check it when you bought it? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was like 48,000. It's like a brand-new car, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, air filters. For all the reasons that we just talked about, you know, VE and, and flow, obviously, you know, anybody who's ever tried to use a vacuum or anything with a stopped up filter, you know that that doesn't flow very much, right? So, I mean, you wouldn't want to try to breathe through that. Your engine doesn't want to breathe through that either. Uh, so that obviously is a very cheap and easy way to gain some power back and can actually create a huge power loss if it gets bad enough, especially when these things get wet. On the big trucks, yeah, they have you know, the box filter, the air filter, but then they have an AC filter, and then inside the cab they have a recirculation filter. So oh, really? So three filters, really, and the AC filters and the recirc filters, when I pull them out, 10 times worse than that right there. Yeah. And people are like, well, no, you ain't got, but dudes, you're breathing this. Yeah, I was just gonna say, man, I've seen some cabin air filters. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I talked about, I bought my wife's car a year ago with 48000 on it. I bought a Subaru a few years ago, and it had 120 some thousand on it. But the cabin air filter in it, it was like growing stuff and like leaves. And I mean, it was just, it was terrible. I don't think anybody had ever changed it in 120 some thousand miles. Well, that's so. how they stink sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I had a Taurus just the other day, AC, you know, came in with an AC complaint. And, uh, you know, put pressure gauges on and everything. Everything was working good there. Compressor was working. All that was working. Uh, blend door motors seemed to be working. So I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. I pull into it and actually get it, get it apart. The whole daggone condenser was packed with, like, dog hair and dust and so much to the point that no air was able to flow through the condenser. So even though the compressor and all that was working, no air was flowing through the, uh, our, I said condenser, but I'm in evaporator. Uh, so I, fi I go find the cabin air filter to see if it had ever been changed. No. It was like a 15-year-old car. Never been changed. Completely destroyed. It had created so much vacuum that it sucked in around the edges and was just sucking in all kinds of crap. But, and all of that ended up right into the evaporator. So that ended up, you know, what could have been a $30 air filter ended up being like an $1,800 evaporator case job. So change your filters, people. <laughs> it's good advice. Paper filters are used in most OEM applications. Original equipment manufacturer, that's what that stands for, in case anybody out there doesn't know. High quality replacements flow adequately for non-modified stock vehicles. Uh, recommended if service interval is 15 to 20,000. I saw that on the internet. I was like, well, what does the internet say about it? And they said 15 to 20K. I personally think it should be sooner than that. I think every 10. Every other oil change, I think, would be a... I think it also depends on your driving conditions, on dirt roads. Yeah, that's what I was just getting to say. Are you out there in the freaking peanut fields all day? Or, you know, you just sitting in the city, you know, for six months at a time? Or whatever the case is. But bottom line is, you know, at least take it out and look at it about every other oil change, I think, would be a, be a fair statement. Most places you go to, most shops, you know, they will pull them out and look at them because, well, it's an upsell if it needs one. But... Also because, you know, they want to make sure that your car is doing as good as it can be doing. Um, again, these are made out of paper, and as you can imagine, they don't take well to moisture. They don't like to be wet, 
Um, I've seen some flood cards come in where they suck water up in the airbox and these things swell up. Looks like wet magazines or newspaper or whatever. Uh, so yeah, make sure they stay dry. Make sure that the box is sealed. This is another one that I run into a lot. And Zach's shaking his head too, so I know he I know he's seen this before. Um, but you know, I just said that most shops will check the air filter. Well, make sure it's a reputable shop because you know the people have pulled the air box apart, look at the air filter. Now nah, I don't want to do it. Stick it back together, put that down, and they left a gap, or they didn't tighten the screws down, or the air filter is a little bit you know cocked in there, and then you're just sucking stuff around it. And I've seen moths and butterflies and dragonflies and all kinds of stuff stuck to the mass air meter, cause the car to run terribly. If you see dust and dirt and everything stuck to the mass air meters and intake air temperature sensors, uh, and they run terribly. Uh, and depending on where the air filter is, it can create an unmetered airflow leak too. So you want to make sure that you uh, you seal those boxes back up. That's very important. So and put all the screws back in it, unless it's a Chevy truck, and then you know they're all stripped out anyway. <laughs> that's because we change them so much. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> uh, so here we go. Now we're on to some good stuff. So cotton or reusable filters. So cotton or fiber filters, uh, these can be made out of various different kinds of, uh, of materials. Sometimes they're cotton, sometimes they're foam. Uh, but there's they're usually some sort of synthetic material that's reusable. It's not paper. Uh, they're higher flow capacity than paper types as you might imagine, because the weave is looser and it actually lets more air flow through it. They can be cleaned and re-oiled instead of replaced, so that's a nice thing. You can just wash them out in the sink, let them dry, hit them with some K&N oil or whatever brand it is that you use. Uh, and they have more surface area combined with a high technology material that allow better filtration even when it starts to become dirty. This is the real advantage to these things. Now, if you drop one of these in your car, are you going to gain a whole bunch of horsepower all of a sudden? Probably not. Uh, but what's really nice about them is that they do flow more than the paper filter, and it's a complicated, convoluted reasoning, but there's something called surface loading. Uh, paper filters, they surface load, they actually catch all the dirt on the outside, and then it ends up blocking the flow, and they has to flow around it, whereas these will actually load internally, and because of the oil, you know, it suspends the dirt, and they can actually, like, bottom line is when they're dirty, they still filter better. So you can actually run them for a longer time. They can actually get dirtier and still flow. They don't stop flowing like paper filters do. Uh, so yes, even though you probably won't pick up you know, the huge gains that uh, they advertise on the box, they are reusable. They are better for the environment, obviously, because you're not throwing away paper filters all the time. And you may pick up a little bit of power, um, but also they do actually filter the air better in most cases as long as you keep up with them. Uh, usually 10, 15,000 miles on these, take them out, wash them, you know, real oil and put it back in, uh, and they'll usually last the life of the car. I think they even warranty them to like 150,000 or something. So yes, that is a definitely an upgrade I would recommend. Uh, even though you're probably not going to see the huge gains, keep in mind it probably will be louder though. You'll hear a lot more intake noise because it's actually moving more air. So you know, you step on the throttle and you get that boop, which I think is cool. But hey, it ain't in it. Everybody's not into it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then we talk about the last thing we're going to talk about with airflow before we move on is the throttle bodies so we got some examples of throttle bodies here we got the cool ITB setup like we saw in the BMW engine earlier uh, the tack module like Chevy trucks use uh, that one's probably just as failed as every one of and then we got a really cool looking uh, kind of carburetor style uh, throttle body right there but the engine's throttle body or throttle valve acts as the engine's air valve controlling the amount of airflow allowed into the intake and metered either by linkage cable or in modern cars by electric motor We'll talk about that in just a second. Throttle body size, just like carburetor size, can be critical to overall performance. Just like a carburetor, oversizing the throttle body produces a lag at low RPM due to low velocity. However, too small and the throttle body becomes a restriction at max VE or high horsepower. That's why it's really important to kind of match these, just like a carburetor. Too big a one, you step on the throttle and it falls on its face, which isn't as big a problem with throttle body injected cars as it is a carbureted car, but still can be a problem, but too small a one, you know, it runs all the way up to max RPM and then falls on its face, and you know, nobody wants that. Um, these, this is another maintenance item, so we're talking about lost power. Carbon, carbon building up on these throttle bodies is a huge problem, especially with these electric TAC module ones. With the old school style ones that had the throttle linkage, you can usually feel it when they start to get carbon on them. I mean, anybody ever driven a car that the throttle kind of felt, it, it was like sticky? Um, 
usually it's because carbon builds up on the back side of this due to condensation. You know, the engine's hot and it gets all these vapors in the intake and you shut it off and it cools off and you get this you get this carbon condensation on the back of the throttle valve. Well, with these electric ones, you can't feel that because there's no direct link between your foot and the throttle body. And so what happens is that it goes for a while and a while and a while and it constantly adjusts, you know, as it gets more and more carbon built up on it. It needs a little bit more and needs a little bit more until it finally gets to the point where the carbon builds up and it actually can strip the gears out in this motor or it can get to a point where it cannot adjust anymore. It's open as much as it can, but it's, it's totally blocked up so that it won't idle or it idles really rough. Uh, and you can, you, you can actually lose power due to that because you know it won't open up all the way. Or if it does open up all the way, there's carbon built up around it and it doesn't allow as much flow. And you can't feel it, and that's the thing. Usually you don't know until it's over. Uh, so when you're doing your air filter, you know, I said about 10 to 15,000, maybe 20,000, depending on how you drive, uh, pull the intake boot off and, and look in there and see if it's all carbon up. You know, they make a ton of products, CRC, Brake Clean, all these people make products to clean throttle bodies. Uh, you know, get a rag, you know, just spray it on the rag, not in the throttle body. Spray it on the rag, rub it in the inside, you know, open the throttle blade up, do that. Uh, and that could save you a ton of money. You know, these are about 600 bucks, uh, you know, for me to put one on in the shop. And without it, you're not going anywhere. So, you know, save yourself the headache and clean the throttle body when you, uh, when you do your air filter too. You had to do that on your car yet, on her Buick? Mm -hmm. No? No, it's about time to get it put in the shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I think it's getting about the right amount of miles on yeah, it. Yeah, she's getting up there. Yeah, yeah. I had to do the BMW recently uh, when I put the air filter in it, as a matter of fact. It doesn't look like anybody's ever done it either. But like I said, the car had less than 50000 on it, so I'm like, uh, they probably ain't had no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, probably a good At idea. Least cabin one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So moving on, we're talking about airflow still, and I'm gonna hit these last few ones real quick, but you know, I talk fast anyway, so you guys you guys are used to keeping up. <laughs> I'll take a little break, breather here while I get a drink. Does this make sense to everybody? Yes? Mm -hmm. Everybody following along? You guys are kind of nodding politely. Makes sense to you guys out there? I hope so. Drop me a line, let me know. Uh, we're talking about exhaust. So we talk about all that airflow coming into the motor, we gotta get it all out. So everything we bring in, we gotta get out. And especially in turbocharged cars and supercharged cars, they're bringing in way more than the car can bring in naturally, so they gotta get way more exhaust out. But this is pretty straightforward. I just thought it was a really simple illustration. Uh, the exhaust system, we got the exhaust manifold, which bolts right to the cylinder head. And then we got a catalytic converter, and then usually a mid-pipe, a resonator, and then the muffler. Um, now, one thing that I have seen before is any kinks, bends, you know, you run over a shopping cart or whatever and it bends the exhaust up in your car, uh, you can actually see a pretty serious performance deficit from... <laughs> They're laughing at me, but I actually did run over a shopping cart in my parents' minivan when I was a teenager, so... <laughs> I may or may not have been trying to push it across the shopping... <laughs> across the parking lot. <laughs> but, Regardless, I ran it over. Shopping cart to run over my car. Yeah, well, as long as you don't put your bumper on one and see how fast you can push a shopping cart, then you know. Although if you get it going just right, it hits the curb on the other end. It's <laughs> neither here nor there. <laughs> so, <laughs> just know that if it falls over, you <laughs> run it over. Uh, so anyway, the biggest power killers here in this system, we've got the exhaust manifold, which can be a power killer, but not from a maintenance item. You know, that's usually if you're modifying a car. Uh, if you've changed anything that's going to change the VE, change the amount of air it can take in, you'll need to change, obviously, the exhaust, how much air it can get out. <coughs> but from a maintenance standpoint, the catalytic converter is the biggest power killer. Um, these things are power killers when they're brand new, but they do do their job that they were designed to do really well. The problem is when they fail, and when they fail, they can actually render a car undrivable. Um, anybody ever seen the inside of a cat before? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask why. Uh, <laughs> because I had one fail on me in Virginia, and I had to bust a hole in it to get back to Florida. Yeah, I was going to say, you were probably uh, you know, at it with a big old pry bar or whatever. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a honeycomb material inside them, and that's, that's actually a chunk of failed catalytic converter right there. This is what they look like usually when they're together. 
Uh, it's a honeycomb ceramic, and it's got some uh, various precious metals on it that does its magic. Uh, but it provides the chemical process to scrub exhaust gases, scrub, uh, of harmful molecules like carbon monoxide, NOx, and hydrocarbons. Uh, it uses various rare metals bonded to a ceramic honeycomb placed in the exhaust stream, operates at temperatures over 600 degrees most of the time, and very sensitive to outside contaminants such as oil, coolant, and fuel additives like lead. So this, the story of the cat goes back actually to the early 70s. Um, you know, they started putting these on cars, I think in 71 or 72 or something like that, and they you still had leaded gas back then, or at least they were starting to uh, get rid of it, but <clears throat> leaded fuels will kill a cat. Um, it, it's what they call, it poisons the cat. The actual, whatever is left over after the leaded fuel burns will end up bonding to the ceramic inside here and it, render it ineffective. That's not as big a problem today as it, as it used to be, but that's a big reason why we got rid of leaded fuels, not only because they were you know, I guess made of lead, uh, but also because they were killing catalytic converters. You now, leaded fuels did have great benefits like valve train lubricity and that sort of thing and great uh, octane ratings, but, you know, they were killing the squirrels and the sea turtles and whatever, so they had to get rid of it. Um, so with the catalytic converter, what kills them nowadays usually is misfires. Misfire is the number one killer of catalytic converters, and this is why if you watched a couple of, uh, of classes ago, we talked about the check engine lights and the warning lights and you know pulling codes and that kind of thing. Well, that's why it's really important because if you have a misfire, if you have something that's making the car run rich, and when I say rich, it means an excess of fuel. That excess of fuel is dumped on the cat. And if you had a V8 car, like you know a Suburban or an Expedition or a Tahoe or whatever, you could have four, or six of these cats, and these could run anywhere between four hundred and six hundred dollars a piece. And some of them are more than that, especially modern cars. They can be over $1,000. Uh, and so you're riding around with a misfire or you're riding around with something that's making it run rich, you know, a stopped up air filter like we just talked about. You're blocking air into the engine, so now it's running rich because it's dumping fuel on it but not having enough air to burn it. And all that excess fuel gets dumped into this hot cat. It's over 600 degrees. And it starts to melt this ceramic. And then you end up with a blockage. Like... David was saying. You end up with a situation where this ceramic actually breaks down to the point where no air can flow through it. And when no air flows through it, no air flows through the engine. So you can actually gradually lose power, lose power, lose power, lose power until the point that it won't run at all, which I have seen before. Uh, twice I've seen cars that wouldn't start because they're so stopped up. Uh, you know the old potato in the tailpipe thing? Yeah, same idea, except the potato is 800 degrees and costs $1,000. Um, <laughs> but that's why it's very important when you do see those check engine lights, when you do see those warnings, uh, to have that you know looked at, to have it diagnosed, because it could be doing cat damage. Um, anybody ever seen the check engine light flash? You know, um, that usually means misfire, and it usually means catalyst damage imminent, or you know, doing catalyst damage. The car doesn't care if you're misfiring, or it doesn't care if you get where you're going. It does care if you're doing catalyst damage, though, and so it starts flashing at you and, and telling you to stop. And again, coolant and oil, another two things that kill cats. Um, you know, you can get coolant in the oil, you know, or coolant in the cat, you know, through intake leaks, you can get it through head gasket leaks, you know, crack block, crack head, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, and oil, obviously, if you got a lot of blow-by, you know, the rings are smoked. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see you. Uh, you end up with uh, you end up with oil being burned in there, and, and the chemical process that goes on inside the cat, you know, oxidation and reduction. Uh, they usually call it two-way or three-way catalysts. That's why they're separated into stages. Uh, that chemical process can't happen if these if these ceramic honeycombs get coated with contaminants, and therefore, you know, they can get real real hot and melt, or they can just be ineffective. They just stop working. They and uh, you usually get a catalyst efficiency code, which again, if you drive a Chevy truck, you've probably seen. Uh, but they monitor this uh, with with O2 sensors, um, and that's why most you know if you got a V8 style car, they usually have four O2s. You know, one in each exhaust bank before the cat, and one in each exhaust bank after the cat. And the ones after the cats are called catalyst efficiency monitors. Easy enough. Uh, so the ones in front of the cat are the ones that the engine is actually using to fuel the car. You know, it's, they're reading the the O2 levels, and they're actually adding fuel, subtracting fuel. They're moving the fuel trims. The ones after the cat are simply there to monitor how effective the cat is being. Uh, 
and they have to be hot in order to work. And that's why you see a lot of modern cars with warm-up strategies that bring them up to temperature real fast. You know, before it would take 10 or 15 minutes for a car to get warm. Well, that entire time that the car wasn't up to temperature, the cat wasn't lit off. And so the EPA and the powers that be and all of those folks decided that, you know, that 10 minutes was killing more squirrels and sea turtles and whatnot. So they, they produced strategies that they could actually warm the cars up really quick using the you know, timing and fueling and different things that they, you know, all kinds of computer strategies to bring them up the temp real fast uh, because they're trying to get that cat lit off as fast as possible. So don't ride your cats out. Just, you know, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Mufflers, that's uh, the last part of the exhaust I'm going to talk about. But this can be a, this can be a power killer. Um, even if you know you're not into you know the race style muffler deal, I get it. Uh, but with with factory mufflers, the insides can actually come apart and create a restriction, just like the cat restriction. Uh, these could, this could be from rust, you know, moisture. There's always condensation. There's always water in the exhaust system. Uh, you take those short trips, you know, you drive you know 40 feet to work and 40 feet back, and you do that all year, and the car never gets hot. Uh, you end up with a lot of condensation in the exhaust system. It rusts. And the insides of these things are actually baffled. You can see where the, the flow doesn't take a straight path. And those baffles can actually rust and fall, in, you know, fall apart. Uh, I've actually run to it before where a cat had failed and all the cat material was piled up in the muffler. So you put a new cat on it and you still have a lack of power because the uh, muffler is full of broken cat material. Uh, and then we, I just put a picture of the race style mufflers up here just to show how straight through they are. You know, there's a little V in it just to make them uh, you know, quieter. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, it's just a straight pipe, and uh, and obviously for race cars and performance cars, that's that's desirable because any restriction in the exhaust equates to a restriction in the engine. So anything you do here to increase airflow, you can in increase airflow in the engine as well. All right, last two, and I think we're going to nail this: fuel pressure and volume. So I told you we're going to talk about the timing one later, but. Fuel pressure killers, clogged up fuel filter or pickup screen. Hopefully that don't look like, that looks like the fuel filter in my Datsun right there. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's my, my, mine might even be worse than that. Uh, yeah, it's got a special rust generating fuel tank on it. So, uh, but yeah, fuel filters are one that gets, they get forgot too, uh, like the cabin air filters. You work on big diesel trucks, so they probably keep up with those a lot more than cars do. A lot of modern cars don't have replaceable fuel uh, filters anymore. <laughs> Some still do, uh, but they're doing away with that. A lot yeah, of them most are. Most of them are in the tank now. Either. Yeah, most of them are the sock in the tank. Um, but again, the the sock in the tank you need to keep that clean because um, a lot of modern cars are direct injected. I think your wife's car is direct injected. My wife says, uh, and so you're not just talking about killing a you know eighty dollar injector. You're talking about killing you know a thousand dollar injector. Um, so it's very, very important to keep, keep contaminants out of the fuel system. Weak or failing fuel pump, you know, usually you hear them, you know, getting loud and whining and doing, making all kinds of noise, but not all the time. Sometimes they just quit. Um, Toyotas are good for that. They, uh, they don't just quit. They just, and they make less and less and less and less pressure, even though the thing still runs. It just gets real weak. Uh, Fords and GMs, they usually just stop. You roll under the truck and hit it with a hammer. Keep on going, uh, but that can cause a drop in fuel pressure, obviously. And one that most people don't think about also is kinked or collapsed fuel supply lines. Most all modern cars use plastic fuel supply lines. I, I don't know whose idea that was. Again, I didn't build it, I didn't break it, and I didn't buy it. But <laughs> they do, they do use plastic fuel supply lines. So let's say that somebody had done some work on the car. Maybe it was in a collision. Uh, and they had some parts off, or you had you know the exhaust down for some reason, or you had something going on where you had to have it worked on, and they kinked the fuel line. It's not like you know you can just bend it back. You know when these plastic lines get kinked or collapsed, that's it. Then you're just replacing them. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind if you do end up fighting a fuel pressure issue. You know something about you know, fuel pressure or volume that can be a big big killer on that. And injector failure. So poor quality fuel. Improper maintenance, engine-based mechanical wear can all contribute to fuel, pure fuel injector performance. Very important to use tier one gasolines and periodic use of fuel system treatments to maintain consistent flow across all injectors. This is another area where everybody's got their own opinion. You know, I like the Lucas brand of products. 
Uh, everybody out there has probably got a certain brand of product they like or their dad liked, you know, STP or Gunk or Gum Out or whoever. Uh, but the bottom line is if you use Tier 1 gasolines, you know, Exxon, Mobil, Shell, Sunoco, places like that, and, and use periodic treatments maybe once a year, you know, once every 15,000 miles, something like that, it can really cut down a lot of these injector problems because like we talked about before, carbon is a killer. And you see the carbon on the tip of this injector. I hope you can see that on there. Uh, not only does it get on the outside of the injector, but obviously using low, to low quality fuels and things such as that, you can get varnish and, and all kinds of contaminants on the inside of the injector, which are a whole lot harder to get out. So decarbon the intake system, decarbon the fuel system is obviously a really good thing. And this chart I thought was pretty cool. So these injectors all look pretty much the same. I mean, there's nothing really outwardly that you could tell. If I were to uh, electrically test each one of these, they probably would ohm out about the same. Um, in fact, you may not even feel, well, you probably would feel some of these, but you may not even feel a problem, maybe not, not feel a, uh, a misfire or anything, but you know, you could be down on power or down on fuel economy uh, due to a weak pattern. So you see right here, number one is fair but weak. So it's kind of got a decent, decently straight stream, but it's not, not really anything to talk about. Uh, number two, these two are both split. So you see a piece of carbon has uh, got on the panel, or the panel has gotten, uh, gotten a chunk of something behind it, and it's split in the pattern. Uh, this one is going way off to the side. You get a fog over here, and you get this, you get this action. Number five is good. It's nice and strong. It's nice and wide. It's nice and straight. And then you see this one, same thing. It's all feathery. It's So all of these injectors are under the same amount of pressure and being opened for the same amount of time. But you can see that there's a very different spray pattern for each one. And that pattern is crucial. That pattern is critical to the way it runs. Um, you know, we talked about atomization earlier in like carbureted intake manifolds, keeping the fuel suspended, uh, that kind of thing. That's where this is really important. You know, this one right here might be spraying it on the roof of the intake runner or you know this right here might be missing the valve altogether or whatever the case the car is still going to run and you may like i said you may or may not even feel a misfire although you may i have seen that before but the bottom line is it's not going to be nearly as efficient as it could be so you're going to be down on power you're going to be down on fuel efficiency so it's very very important to keep the injectors clean keep the fuel system clean use tier one fuels um, and avoid and like i said with modern cars being direct injected it's usually not a case of an 80 or $90 injector in a couple hours. It's usually a case of a couple thousand dollars worth of injectors in many, many hours. Um, so, yeah, you definitely definitely want to keep, uh, keep all that stuff clean. 703. Nailed it. <laughs> you guys got any questions, uh, questions out there? Yeah, makes sense. I talk too fast. Did I talk too fast for you guys? No, we're just. I think yeah, I think all my uh, I think all my people are actually in here tonight. You know, there's only been a handful of you guys online, but hopefully you guys will share it. Uh, you know, you, it'll be on YouTube after I get to back to the house, so you can go back and watch it if you like. Again, the handout materials are in the description of this video, uh, and I invite you guys to come out and visit us uh, live and in person because I definitely like talking to live people uh, more so than I do the camera. So hopefully, I'll see you guys out here soon, and I appreciate you. Thank you.